So I'm going to talk about two things today. Um, the first thing I'm going to talk about is an application that we've been working on. Um, and Shreep, I think, alluded to it during this morning's keynote. It's, it's basically a, an application for financial people to analyze journals, uh, journal entries from their general ledger system. And it's the first kind of component of our CFO.ai um, suite. The second thing I'll talk about is, is what was advertised in the talk, which is basically how to productionalize models and, and um, a particular design pattern related to uh, putting models in Amazon Web serv uh, Services uh, Lambda uh, endpoints and then being able to call them from an application. So let me plug in. Okay, make that one step bigger. So what you're looking at here is uh, a, a couple of charts, and these two charts <clears throat> are showing the uh, total population of journals from a, a fictional company <clears throat> about uh, a, a, an overall breakdown of the riskiness level or the, the unusualness level of these journals. Um, this is meant for a finance person to be able to get a quick view of what their organization looks like and, and give an opportunity for them to drill down into points or, or in this case, uh, transactions that look like they might be interesting. So on the left side, this chart here, uh, the, the, the x-axis is the score and the y-axis is the number of journals that that hit that score. Um, and on the right-hand side, the x-axis is the same score, and the y-axis is the value of that transaction. So these two side-by-side -side are intended to give you a quick overview of what it's, what's going on in your organization. Uh, and, and the reason, the motivation for this was actually uh, from a, an audit use case. So uh, in, in today's world, auditors, um, the way they kind of approach the problem of finding transactions that are interesting is they'll go and, and sort of basically do searches. Um, they'll, they'll search, for example, for uh, find me transactions that were done on a Saturday or find me transactions that are over a certain amount of, of money, um, which if that turned out to be a bad transaction, they would then have to go and tell the client. And so uh, it's, very, it's kind of a manual process, and they're definitely uh, thinking, hey, I wonder um, if we could improve our lives if we were able to, instead of just going and, and basically hunting for the needle in the haystack, instead have a machine learning um, a tool be able to go through and evaluate all of the different points in the haystack, give them each a score of unusualness, and then sort them, and then say, here are my top 100. And then instead of going and trying to hunt, go take a look at the top 100 right off the bat. And so here you can see, um, for this particular organization, uh, here are the top you know, 100. And so, what we can see is, is these columns on the right here are partial scores. So you can think of, of these individual transactions. They're, they each have attributes, and partial scores are derived from these attributes. So for example, you can think of uh, user and approver combinations. If, if the same person that's posting a transaction is also approving it, you're going to bump up the riskiness score the unusualness score of that transaction. Uh, if a transaction is backdated here in this, this uh, feature right here, then you're going to say, okay, well, if it's, it's a backdated transaction, that's going to bump up the, the unusualness factor. And there are a few others here, uh, mostly around amounts and days and times that things are done, uh, the activity of that particular user that's posting the transaction. Um, and so let me just dive in uh, to one of these neat uh, visuals here. And these, these visuals are the product of um, our, our design team that, that recently uh, hired in. And you can see here, this is a, a, an unusual uh, day of the week. So this particular journal uh, for $1.3 million was uh, flagged for having an unusual day and time. 
And if you take a look, here there's a, a visual that's trying to break down, trying to give you uh, a sense of why this journal was flagged in the context of the entire data set. And here you can see, okay, this journal was posted on a Saturday, and that's unusual, and you can see the size of the dot there. It's very, very small compared to the other, um, the other regular days of the week, the, the work days, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And so uh, just an example of how we're trying to combine uh, our, um, the work from our new visuals team with business applications and to bring them uh, to, to um, uh, vertical use cases uh, like the CFO.ai use case. Uh, taking this a little bit further down, you can see there's a nice account summary. This is what a, an accountant or an auditor is going to expect to see, basically account names and debits and credits, the, the cumulative value for this journal, as well as individual line items within the journal and you know, what flagged for the individual line items. Um, so just, just a quick preview of, of the kinds of things that we're looking at um, for the future uh, on this product. Um, one more visual I'll show you before I move to the next demo. Uh, here's an unusual amount uh, flag. So here you can see this particular journal uh, was over a million dollars, 1.3 in fact, as you can see from the, the graphic. Uh, and as you can see by the curve, the vast majority of journals uh, posted uh, by this user are far, far less than that. So that also tripped another partial score. You take those partial scores and you roll them together to form a cumulative score for an individual transaction. OK. Um, so let me move to the next demo. And the next demo, uh, let me set it up for a moment, just kind of describing what I'm going to do. The next demo is about um, basically uh, an application deployment in the cloud using Amazon Web Services to deploy the model. But it's actually uh, an application that a customer brought to us, interestingly enough. And let me kind of walk through. Uh, what his use case and, and needs were. Uh, and oh, by the way, if you want to find the slides, they'll be in GitHub. So let's talk about the motivation a little bit. So uh, I broke it up into three pieces, needs, um, requirements, and technologies. And let's, let's start with the needs. So what the customer um, had is a situation where they, they have data, but they need to do feature engineering in order to get the right kind of signal from the model, they wanted to actually build features in order to feed them into the model. This is a very common thing to do. Um, but he didn't just want to stop there. He wanted to actually be able to reuse that feature engineering in production. And I've spoken with a few of you uh, in the audience about this very topic today. And it's, it's, a, it's a really, really common thing to want to do. So you're building features in training. I want to apply those same feature transformations in production. Um, and that's something that, that we'll talk about here. Um, so the next thing he wanted to do from a needs perspective is he needed to, uh, of course, use machine learning and use machine learning predictions. That's why he was using H2O. Um, in terms of what, what his requirements there, he wanted good accuracy for his models, you know, highly accurate models. And he wanted them to be real time. He wanted to be able to deploy it in a real time environment. Um, and taking that next step about the deployment need, he wanted to be able to deploy them in production very, very smoothly. So instead of having to have a complicated handoff between um, you know, himself, which and he's a data scientist, and his DevOps team, he wanted to be able to uh, make, it, make it really, really smooth. Instead of having to describe complicated uh, modeling procedures to the DevOps folks, what he wanted to be able to do is to, inside the data science team, build the model and turn it into a package that he could then hand off to the, uh, to the ops team to deploy. Um, so speed to deployment, easy handoff. Um, also, built-in scalability is something he was really interested in. And uh, not having to manage the infrastructure is, is a key win. And to, to achieve these things, um, the three technologies on the right were chosen. So on the, on the feature engineering side, he chose to build it in Jython. And let me just flip forward to the next slide, which has a, a few bullet points on each of these technologies. On the feature engineering side, he chose to build them in Jython. 
because that let him run his feature transformations on his laptop, on his Hadoop cluster. And oh, by the way, um, Jython is a, uh, if you haven't heard of it, it's basically a way of running Python code in Java. So what it does is it lets you, within a Java program, instantiate a Python interpreter and then run Python natively inside your Java process. Now, the, the pros of that are it executes fast, um, but the con is that a lot of most Python packages won't work. Like, you've got to, it, it, you're limited to, a, limited to a restricted set of Python code. Uh, in particular, if you've got C code um, as part of your Python package, it won't magically run in Java. Uh, so he chose Jython because he could then use, um, get the speed he wanted to be able to run his, his feature transformations in his, uh, his, his training environment, but then also be able to run them in the AWS Lambda, which, oh, by the way, uh, does a very nice job of, of hosting Java environment and get those uh, DevOps things that we talked about as well. Um, AWS Lambda is a way of hosting arbitrary function code in the cloud. So basically, the data science guy in this case was able to build his uh, package of code with a, with a handler, and then that handler uh, called his feature transformations and, and predictive modeling step, and then just give that to the ops person and deploy it in the cloud. Uh, and the other thing that's really nice about using Lambda for a use case like this is it's very scalable, it's very convenient. You don't have to manage anything yourself, you basically just push it to the cloud and Amazon will take care of scaling it for you. Um, and then of course the third technology that he's using here is, is the H2O generated POJO model. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with that, it, it's, it's the plain old Java object model uh, that you can basically take a snapshot of a model you've been using, you've been building in H2O and export it and then easily deploy it in uh, any environment that supports Java, including Lambda. Uh, one of the key takeaways of, of H2O POJOs is it's just math. It doesn't depend on having the full H2O there. So it's very easy to embed it in a, a microservice or in a, a Lambda endpoint um, or you know, really anything that's, that's Java. So here's a, here's a very abstract deployment diagram of what I just talked about. Um, the left-hand hand side is the training side, the right-hand side is the production side, and you can see the feature engineering steps are common. The training on, on, the, on the, uh, the data on the training side uh, could very well be larger. The data on the production side uh, is being processed in real time, um, and you can see that handoff uh, of that POJO model from the training to production, and then you can imagine having that right-hand side, that production side, all running in AWS Lambda. Uh, and you can imagine having an application wrapping around that right production side. So, and, and that's what I'm gonna show you. you. You can have an application sending data into the top of the right-hand side and having the predictions coming back to the application. In this case, uh, I'm gonna show you a JavaScript application um, with uh, a neat little uh, domain name classification problem. So let's get into the, into the use case. So the use case is uh, trying to identify malicious domains. So you can imagine that um, botnets or, or phishing or things like that, basically attack vector, internet attack uh, vectors originating from malicious domains which are automatically generated uh, uh, in order to defeat um, security t uh, tools. And so our goal with this problem is to classify a domain name as either legitimate or malicious. Uh, and here are a couple of examples uh, that I've shown you. Now to do this, we need to build some features. So what's going to come in is basically just a domain name. And what we want to do is build some features both as part of our training and as part of our production process, and then feed those into a model. So the features we're gonna build, there are four of them. Um, string length, uh, the longer the string, the more likely it is a, a generated thing that's, that's malicious. Uh, entropy, the more random it is, the more likely it is to be uh, generated and malicious. Uh, the number of substrings that are English words, those are actually less likely to be malicious the more substrings you have. 
And the proportion of vowels, it turns out that real words have vowels and generated things often don't have as, as many vowels. So these are the features we're going to build. Uh, the malicious domain model is a, a GLM model. It's a binomial classifier. It's, uh, we're going to use ridge regression as, as the uh, regularization. And here's just an example of uh, what, the, what the confusion matrix looks like on the, the validation data. Um, we did a 80-20 uh, split of, of training versus validation, and this is the, the, uh, the held out data and the confusion matrix on it. So let's do a, a quick look at the deployment architecture. Uh, I showed you the abstract one. This is, this is the real one. So this is the actual deployment architecture. Um, you've got a JavaScript application, and I'll show you an example of that in just a second. And you've got this JavaScript application interacting with the user, and the user's typing in a domain name like I mentioned. The JavaScript application is using a REST API to access the, this whole right-hand side uh, feature, munging, feature munging, feature engineering, and modeling. So there's a, a post request that's going from the, Java applica the JavaScript application and a JSON response coming back. And here's an example message. Uh, I just threw one up here so you can see kind of concretely what's happening. Um, as I said, the thing that's going from the left side from the JavaScript into um, the, the Lambda endpoint is just a domain name, and the thing that's coming back are probabilities and then information about which features, the four features that, that we mentioned, um, basically the, the values that they were getting uh, after being evaluated. And here's just a, a quick picture. This is almost the same thing as, as the last two slides. Now they're just overlaid on top of each other, showing you where the different pieces are, are coming into play. Uh, and the, the one that's kind of, I would say, the most interesting is that Jython feature munging part where, uh, you know, as part of your actual production pipeline, you're using that feature engineering to take one, one domain coming in, turn it into four features, and then feeding that to your model, which then gets returned to the application. Uh, okay, so now I've kind of set up the problem. And I'll, let me just run it for you. It, it'll just take a moment. Um, let me get out of PowerPoint and go back to my web browser and pull up the front end. So this front end, you can see, is running inside uh, my web browser right now. It's basically uh, a JavaScript application that's running in, in Safari, uh, and that's making a request to Amazon EC2s, or, or, or Lambda, I should say, to, to the Lambda endpoint that's hosting the feature munging and hosting the model like I just showed in the last slide. And what's coming back is what you see at the bottom here. Oops. It's, uh, so this please don't hack me, thanks, bye is being classified as malicious. Um, and here are the contributions of the, the different features to that prediction. We can play with some other things, too. Let's try uh, H2O open tour. OK, well that's, thanks. Uh, thankfully, that's legitimate. Uh, but if we add some more you know, values to it, you can see adding enough junk to the end and it makes it start looking like something that was generated and, and malicious. And what's nice about an application like this, and you can um, imagine lots of different applications you might write, but every time I hit a keystroke, it creates a new request to the Lambda endpoint, which then makes a prediction, sends it back, the application shows it, and I can interact in, in real time. Uh, so that's just a quick demo of the app. Let me go back to uh, PowerPoint. So uh, let's get into a little bit of code. Not too much code, but just, just enough to give you a sense of what's going on. So the, the first part of, of this uh, Lambda uh, overall um, uh, workflow is basically uh, reaching the, the Lambda function handler. And you can see uh, this piece of code that I've thrown up here. It's Java, and it is really, really simple. Like anybody that's been doing Java uh, programming for the last 10 years will probably recognize this pattern. It looks really similar to a Java servlet, 
but instead of being a servlet, it's basically a Lambda handler. And so what happens is you get a request, you unpack the request for um, the, the particular uh, parameters that you need, and then you send back a response. And so what we're doing here, uh, because we're, we're actually running the Jython inside of the Lambda handler that I mentioned, uh, basically we're instantiating this Py module, which is creating a Python interpreter, passing the parameters to it, and then um, executing the feature munging, which I'll show you on the next slide here. Uh, and here you can see this is Python code that's being evaluated inside the, Lambda, the Java Lambda endpoint. And this Python code is basically just calculating each of the features one by one. And then when it's done, uh, we'll go to the model prediction. And here what you see is, this is probably a bit of an eye chart, but I wanted to try to fit it on one slide. The, the top half here is Python code uh, calling this predict function, and the bottom half is showing you the generated model code uh, from the, the generated uh, POJO uh, coming out of H2O. So the, the bottom half is showing you the GLM binomial classification logistic regression code, and the top half is showing Python calling that uh, for this particular use case. OK, just a couple more points. Um, you know, configuring Lambda functions, it's actually really easy. There's really only one knob to tune, actually two. The first knob is memory. And what memory is really a proxy for everything. So it's sort of like small, medium, large kind of a configuration. Um, you, you specify the size of memory that you want, and then CPU and network bandwidth and, and other things scale with it. Um, and the other thing you can specify is timeout. So if you want to say, OK, I want my Lambda function to execute for no more than uh, 30 seconds, and if it doesn't finish, then you know, it, it aborts uh, to prevent you know, the Lambda function from being hit by, uh, by bad attacks, then, then you can set that as well. Uh, in terms of pricing, uh, I don't want to go into the details really here. Uh, but it turns out that for a Fortune 100 company, it's quite, quite affordable. It's about a dollar an hour. Um, they, they weren't going to be set too far back by that for this particular use case. Uh, in their particular case, they wanted um, uh, hundreds of thousands of transactions per hour. So not a huge, hugely high transaction rate, uh, but you know, enough that if you had to set up infrastructure for it yourself and have it be available, you know, five nines, et cetera, et cetera, uh, it would definitely, um, it's definitely easier to do this uh, than set up your own. And then from a performance point of view, we did a little bit of experimentation, not, not too much, but just, just enough to show that uh, if you increase the load, the, the throughput does go up and the latencies don't get affected too much. This is actually kind of a, a cheating test because it's really just one, um, one computer driving the endpoint. And practice, you'd have many, many you know, spread throughout the internet, most likely. This particular use case was an, an IoT device that might have uh, thousands or, or even more um, users kind of making predictions uh, simultaneously. Uh, but uh, here we just tested it in a, in a fairly simple way. Um, so that's, that's about uh, it for this, uh, this use case as well. So with that, I'm going to wrap up. And if, if we have time for questions, then maybe I'll take one. And if not, then I'll hand it off to the next, uh, to the next event. Any questions? And as I... Is this whole uh, thing on GitHub, the Lambda, if I, if I want to try it on Amazon, can, is, is all the code available for me to just, yeah, just plug so, in and try? Yeah, thanks for asking. So the question is, is the code available? And it absolutely is. Uh, let me go to this page, uh, this screen right here. Uh, so these resources are on the web. This example is in GitHub, uh, in the H2O AI uh, organization's GitHub. The name of the repo is App Malicious Domains. Uh, and this, the, the slides for this talk, I will push to the H2O um, meetups repo and anywhere else that, that uh, we post after the, the conference. Um, and of course, there's Lambda documentation itself and the uh, generated POJO documentation and the H2O Python documentation. Uh, those are all available. Let me do one more thing. I will also show you here in the repo 
for this example. Uh, there's quite a, a good walkthrough of how to build the project, create a Lambda function, including screenshots of what you would need to do to make your own Lambda endpoint. Uh, you need to do a, a few different steps in order to, to make it work, and they're all chronicled here in the, the GitHub repo for this example, which is app malicious domains. Uh, that's, that's probably impossible to read, but it's H2O AI app malicious domains. Um, let me show you one more thing. Um, this is actually the code for the generated POJO model. So for those of you that haven't seen this uh, before, let me just pull it up. And this is, this is what generated code for a model that comes out of H2O looks like. This is for logistic re regression. Um, and you, but you can imagine having tree models can get incredibly complicated or a deep learning model. Uh, much nicer to generate this stuff than to try to write it yourself. Uh, any other questions? Uh, question, we got a lot of time for questions. Okay. Good Tom. Thank you. Thank you.